Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. Um, we have a really excited, pro exciting program coming for you. So tonight we will be meeting author David Sobel, who will give a presentation based on his new book, Best Bike Rides in New England. Sobel will reveal three of his favorite rides, discuss the variables he uses when designing a ride, explain how to design rides using online tools like Map My Ride or Strava, and advocate for incorporating bike riding into your personal wellness regime. My name is Susan Eastland, and I'm on the programming team here at Cary Library. Before we begin, I want to take a moment to thank the Cary Library Foundation. Their support enables us to bring tonight's program um, to you. This program is presented in collaboration with the Friends of Lexington Bikeways and Bike Lexington and the following public libraries, Ashland, Broughton, the Lucius Beebe, Maynard, Newton, the Peabody Institute, Randall, Robbins, Somerville, and Stowe. So thank you so much everyone from those libraries for tuning in. If you have any questions, please submit them to the Q&A. Um, we'll be going over the questions at the end, um, or if you have any during um, the program too, please feel free to send them through and we can ask David as he's going through. This program is being recorded and will be posted to the library's YouTube channel. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker. David Sobel is a professor emeritus in the education department at, can everyone hear me okay? I'm assuming someone would have said something if they can't. Let me just check. Okay, thank you for the response. All right, I'm gonna keep going. Um, David Sobel is a professor emeritus in the education department at Antioch University, New England in Keene, New Hampshire. He consults and speaks widely on child development, place-based education, and nature-based early ed childhood education. He has authored 10 books and more than 90 articles focused on children and nature for educators, parents, environmentalists, and school administrators in the last 30 years. His most recent books are Wild Play, Parenting Adventures in the Great Outdoors, The Sky Above and the Mud Below, Lessons from Nature Preschools and Forest Kindergarten, and most recently, Best Bike Rides in New England. So welcome, David. Thanks, Susan. It's a pleasure to have this opportunity. Um, as Susan said, I'm gonna uh, describe what this book is about and describe three rides in some kind of detail to give you a sense of whether this is something you wanna plunk down 23 bucks of your hard earned cash to get. Um, and then at the end, I'll, uh, kind of demonstrate how I plan a ride and uh, mostly focus on using Map My Ride, which is the tool that I've gotten used to. Uh, and as Susan said, if you've got questions as I'm going along, it's fine to interrupt me. Uh, so the I didn't really want to call this book Best Best Rides, Best Bike Rides in New England, because <clears throat> I thought it was a little self-congratulatory. Uh, and, uh, you know, I said, these are going to be great. These are great bike rides, but I'm not sure the best ones. If they were the best bike rides, I would have to include the Franconia Notch Bike Trail and the Shining Sea Rail Trail in Falmouth and the uh, Cape Cod Rail Trail, which I've done a lot of loops off of. The carriage trails in Acadia are remarkable. And I really feel bad that the bike, the book doesn't include a Champlain Valley bike ride, which is really one of the great places to ride in New England. Instead, uh, what I was trying to do was write a book about lesser nodes, lesser known rides, mostly on back roads. I'll use kind of paved bike trails as spines or as a component of a bike ride. But for the most part, I wanted to uh, do bike rides that explore lost villages and little hidden corners of New England. Uh, there is a bike ride in the book. I'm not going to talk about it tonight that goes down Rattlesnake Gutter Road. Uh, which is both my favorite place name and one of the cooler spots in central Massachusetts. So these bike rides are not for the Tuesday afternoon crowd of spandexed riders uh, that want to go a quick 40 miles on their road bikes. Um, instead, it's for uh, folks who want to explore diverse landscapes and be surprised and kind of poke into little corners, go to a cool swimming hole, find a great little cafe that you wouldn't know about unless somebody had told you about. Um, so it's really more for those that group of folks 
down in the lower left hand corner. And so here are the design principles that I've used for creating these rides. Um, they're, all, they're all pretty easy, moderate rides. So they range from 10 to 25 miles in length. So not day long kind of rides. Uh, I'm completely into loopification. I do not like going out and back on the same uh, trail. So every ride is a loop or sometimes a couple of interconnected loops. I'm really into landscape diversity. Uh, you know, so by the end of the ride, you're supposed to think, wow, I have just been to half a dozen really different intriguing places. So I don't like rides that kind of do the same thing for an hour or two. I'm into topography, but not too much. So usually 500 feet of elevation gains up to a thousand, usually not more than 1500 feet. Um, and I'll explain later about you know, how you calculate elevation gain as part of planning design, uh, planning bike loops. I'm very much into architectural integrity and lost villages. That's really uh, my focus in the book, I think, is taking you to these interesting lost villages. And then uh, each ride includes a swim, a recommended swim spot and a cool place to eat. Uh, I'm a big advocate for eating after bike rides rather than in the middle, but in the middle is always a possibility. That image down in the lower right-hand corner is a great little swimming hole called Green Frog. And it's on um, the Gale River uh, in um, Franconia, New Hampshire. So <clears throat> in a lot of these pictures, you're gonna see my wife, uh, not many pictures of me, but usually a lot of pictures of my wife we're or mostly retired. We ride those kind of hybrid bikes that you can see there. Uh, and I have to confess that we're about to buy e-bikes. I think of it as a, as a deal with the devil and kind of a compromise. Uh, but uh, we want them as, an, as a way to kind of expand our scope of different kinds of rides. Um, and I also have a mountain bike that I use for sandy trails on Cape Cod. Uh, we've biked thousands of miles in, in hundreds of different places in New England and around the U.S. Had this great bike ride along the Brooklyn Esplanade as the moon was rising one night. Been on a bunch of Florida bike rides. <clears throat> the bike ride in Florida that I was most thinking about when I chose this, it was a symbol. This is from the bike ride that I did. On the bike ride that I did, the trail was a lot narrower and the alligator was completely across the trail. And so we had to figure out how to move the alligator off the trail using the bike as kind of a, a guard in between my body and the alligator. It was really a little ner uh, nerve wracking and fun when it was all over. We've done some uh, multi-day long bike rides, the Petit Train de Nord route in Quebec from north of Montreal down to near Montreal is a great multi-day bike trail of about four or five days. Um, it's all the little old French uh, village, all the old French depots are now cute little cafes. <clears throat> and then in the work that I've been doing, I do a lot of lecturing and consulting around the country on nature-based and place-based education. So whenever I go someplace, I figure out how to bike there. So I've biked in all these different kinds of places. For a while, I had a regular thing I was doing in Santa Barbara. And if you're going to California, Santa Barbara is a great bike destination. Uh, and we've also biked a lot in uh, the UK, um, in, especially in the Cotswolds, which is another great bike destination if you want to go overseas. In winter, uh, this is part of the, you know, how do you make your regular uh, daily regimen uh, involves some kind of regular outdoor experience. <clears throat> in the winter when we don't bike, we like to cross country ski. Sometimes we uh, like to skate during what we call the wildlife season. I love this image of skating on Echo Lake at the end of November a couple of years ago. Um, and um, even when we were working, we tried to do the three to five 
uh, bike rides or cross country skis a week. And it really kind of gave a good shape to our lives. So what I really wanted to do was write a bike, a backroads biking in the Mananoc region guide, but the publisher wasn't interested. They said, nope, too narrow a scope. Uh, so we want you to write a New England bike guide, uh, which intimidated me uh, first off. But the more we thought about it, the more I realized that I really had done uh, interesting bike rides in all six New England states. Uh, and so we rose to the challenge. And so writing the book <clears throat> was a great project during those summer pandemic years, because uh, it was a great way to be out in the world and socially distanced and not in enclosed spaces. So I'm going to describe three of my favorite bike rides, two that are within 90 minutes of Lexington, uh, or the Boston metro area, one that is goes through Lexington, which some of you will probably know. And then I will share a, 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 a kind of a Boston bike ride. So this one is a about 19 miles, has an elevation gain of about 1400 feet. And there's two options. You can either do the whole ride or it's broken up into two subcomponents if you want to do a shorter ride. And this is the my backyard. You'll actually see a picture of my house when I describe this uh, loop. So each ride comes with this nice map and the elevation profile, which is down there underneath. Um, and you know, you use if you're planning bike rides and you're using Map My Ride or Strava, there's a always an elevation function, so you can plot out a ride, see what the elevation changes are, and then decide whether you want to take on big hills or not. So this ride starts over here on the left-hand side of the map in a little village called Chesham. I live near Chesham, and then goes through a bunch of interesting lost villages. So there you start in the Lost Village of Chum. You uh, climb up back roads to these great views of Mount Monadnock. You pass, uh, one of the great things about this ride, that's why it's called Land of Lakes, is that you pass multiple bodies of water. This area, Harris Hill Nelson is on the, um, right on the watershed between the Merrimack and the Connecticut River. So there's lots of, uh, of um, ponds and lakes. The second lost village you come to is the classic hilltop village of Nelson, New Hampshire. Um, all these hilltop villages got left behind. They were the original settlements in interior New England in the late 1700s. Uh, and they were uh, farming locations. And then uh, eventually uh, the, village, the village centers migrated down to uh, where the streams and the ponds were for water power. So you go through this hilltop village of Nelson, New Hampshire. And then after four or five miles, you go through Harrisville, New Hampshire, which is the town I live in, a national historic landmark. Uh, one of the best preserved mill towns in New England. And each ride comes with a treasure hunt image. Uh, so a building or an architectural feature or some intriguing uh, thing along the way that you're tr looking for uh, to try and find as a treasure hunt treasure. So this is the public library in Harrisville which is uh, tucked away and you're supposed to find it on your ride. After a long climb, you wind up traversing the shores of Dublin Lake. You don't go through the center of Dublin Village because it's kind of not a lost village. It's right on a main road. But when you get on the backside of the lake, it's beautiful. This is actually not a photograph, but a painting by Rockwell Kent, <clears throat> who painted in Dublin in the early part of the 20th century. After Dublin Lake, you slip onto a quiet back road, which has this beautiful, long, gentle downhill through dappled hemlocks. And you then emerge in these shockingly green meadows. 
It's one of my favorite downhills in the Monadnock region. You'll pass by my house along the way, right towards the end, and then you end where you started back in the village of Chesham. In terms of um, a great place to stop either in the middle of the ride or at the end of the ride, the Harrisville General Store is part of this movement of rebirth in general stores uh, throughout New Northern New England. And Harrisville, the Harrisville General Store has basically become a destination lunch spot. So if you do this ride, you go past it in the middle of the ride, but you wanna come back here, either wanna stop there in the middle of the ride or come back there for lunch later on. Okay, so that was my backyard, now your backyard. Um, I'm always interested in figuring out how to do back roads, loops in urban and suburban places. So this one solves this problem in a remarkably wonderful way, I think. Uh, I'll be interested to find out afterwards how many people have actually put this loop together themselves. So it's gonna start in Concord, uh, way over there on the left-hand side of the uh, map. And it's gonna, and it, ties together the reformatory branch trail and the Minuteman commute, commuter bike trail and the Battle Road Trail through Minuteman National Historic Park. And I love the fact that it goes, that it circumnavigates Hanscom Air Force Base and you never realize that it's there. And for people who are looking at the elevation profile and who live in Lexington, I'm wondering if you can figure out where that little pointy piece is right in the middle of the ride. So you start uh, just north of the Concord Green um, in this little nice little upscale uh, shopping center called Millbrook Terry. And right across the street from the shopping uh, center is this tiny little trail that heads into the woods uh, that is, doesn't look like a great bike trail in the beginning because it's kind of single track, but it turns into a wider trail. Uh, I know that um, it's the reformatory branch trail. I know that there is a lot of uh, question and if anybody actually knows what's happening with this now, I'd be interested to find out. Um, I think there's a lot of interest in transforming this into a paved trail like the Minuteman commuter trail. And I think there's this Concord uh, initiative to keep it the way it is. So somebody can let me know what's happening with that. Uh, the first part of this on the reformatory branch trail is great, it goes by the Great Meadows National Wildlife Refuge. There's lots of little sidewalks or bikes you can do onto some of those trails. Uh, after about five miles, you wind up at the Bedford uh, Depot. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. The whole quality of the experience changes when you get to the Bedford Depot. It was one of the, I think it's the first place I've ever seen public sunscreen dispensers. And the, uh, you know, the, uh, the treasure, oh no, this is not the treasure hunt image from the book, but I love the fact that this uh, old rail car is parked there at the depot. You then do the Minuteman commuter depot, uh, commuter trail down into the heart of Lexington. Uh, and this is the treasure hunt image. I'm sure many of you can, um, can kind of see in your mind's eye where this is. Uh, if you're not from Lexington, uh, it's hard not to be moved by this, uh, this saying from Captain John Parker when you're there. Um, so I love going by the, the Lexington Green. You then head out of Lexington, up over, that's where the, uh, that peaky point is. There's that kind of steep little hill on Mass Ave as you go up and over and back down towards Concord. And then you find the end of the battle trail. Battle trail, of course, being the trail that the, uh, the red coats uh, advanced to Concord on and then uh, ran back to Boston along as they got uh, ambushed and trailed by uh, the Conf uh, revolutionary battle soldiers. Uh, and I love biking the battle trail because it feels uh, like it, it might have been 250 years ago, and it's just a, it's just a beautiful um, 
up and down, twisty kind of trail. Nicely preserved architecture along the way. Uh, great boardwalks across the marshy areas where you're supposed to walk your bikes, but it's hard to resist walking your bikes on those boardwalks. On the way, and then there's a little bit of kind of traffic eatiness as you head back into Concord from the end of the battle trail. Okay. So that's a great ride. It's about 15 or 16 miles. It's remarkably traffic free, except for a couple of sections. And it's right there in your backyard. So try it out. The last one um, is, uh, I love having figured out this bike ride because it takes you to two incredibly different places. So this starts in Turner's Falls. Many, I suspect a lot of people have never been to Turner's Falls. I lived in New England for 50 years before I found my way there, uh, which is a really interesting little lost city. Um, and it's going to go uh, from Turner's Falls uh, through Deerfield, which is another remarkably uh, preserved historic place. And so this really captures the sense of having been to lots of different places in a short amount of time. So you start this ride uh, right in the center of Turner's Falls at the Great Falls Discovery Center, which is an interpretive center. Uh, and you quickly descend from the parking area down to, oh, that's right, I have to do this. There's the map. Starts in Turner's Falls up there in the upper right-hand corner. It's going to go down into the Deerfield River Valley and the Connecticut River Valley. Um, and loop through Deerfield back to Turner's Falls. So you head down along the Power Canal. So this is the Power Canal taking water out of the Connecticut River there at Turner's Falls. Uh, that was used initially as a uh, transportation canal, but then became a um, the power source for all those mills that are down there on the right-hand side. There they are. Uh, a lot of paper mills in Turner's Falls at the end of the 19th century and into the 20th century. This is a beautiful long trail along the canal. And if you uh, have a tech startup and you're looking for old industrial mill space that would be kind of cheap, uh, there's a lot of it in Turner's Falls. After Turner's Falls, you, you kind of weave through a little corner of Greenfield, Massachusetts, and then up out of the valley and into what I call orchard land. Uh, you go through this great long stretch from Greenfield heading down towards Deerfield above uh, Interstate 91. And it's um, long stretches of orchards, of apple orchards and peach orchards. and it's a great mid ride stop to stop at Clarkdale at this giant orchard to get an apple and some cider. You descend from orchard land and you cross over the Deerfield River. And you get down into the alluvial soil of uh, the Deerfield River and the Connecticut River. So the, the Connecticut River. Uh, floodplains and the Deerfield River floodplains are really the, I like to think of them as the vegetable basket of New England. Uh, and so there's this stretch through uh, farmland, which is all alluvial soil land, where you can find asparagus and lilies and potatoes and uh, lawn turf. Uh, it's this incredible diversity of products. And if you're, and some years, you probably, you probably recognize that plant up there in the upper left-hand corner. I think this is actually hemp rather than uh, consumable marijuana. You come out of that kind of farmland, which you can see in the upper part of this image, and you, uh, you rise up out of this farmland, and all of a sudden you're in uh, early, you know, late 18th century, early 19th century Deerfield. And um, Deerfield's kind of like Sturbridge or Plymouth Plantation, but way less, uh, way less amenitized. And it's obviously the 
location for Deerfield Academy, which is kind of very uh, upscale and posh, but the preservation of the homes and the museums are fantastic. So you, uh, there's this great alley of uh, maples down the center of historic Deerfield. And it was, uh, I realized um, after being on many bike rides that whenever you had the sense that some place looked beautiful and historic, or you felt transported back in time, it was often a function of the fact that there weren't any power lines. Because the power lines really change your whole sense of feeling of the landscape. And so when you're on a road that doesn't have power lines, it feels old and you feel transported in time. So in Deerfield, all the power lines are buried. And uh, I love collecting pictures of doorways and windows from historic homes around New England. So there's a frontest page piece in the book that's a montage of these kinds of window and door images. After you kind of go north on Route 5 for about a mile or two, you cut off and then you're in this other world. So you've been in Turner's Falls, you've been in Orchard Land, you've been in Farmland, you've been in Deerfield. And then all of a sudden you come to one of the biggest rail yards in New England. It's another one of those places that's not really on the map. You'd never expect to, you, you wouldn't expect to see it, but there it is, it's this giant uh, rail yard with tons of rail cars and about 17 different tracks. It's the center for lots of crossing trail rails in New England. So past the rail yard, you cross back across the Connecticut River on a pedestrian bike bridge, and you're back into Turner's Falls. And then uh, at the end of this ride, I, I always, again, recommend uh, places to eat. This is a not a lunch place, but a dinner place. Uh, if you can find your way to the Gill Tavern, which is a lost village in its own right, um, the Gill Tavern is one of those ex exceptionally wonderful places to eat. Uh, you get to sit next to the open kitchen and you feel like, again, you've been transported in time. Okay, how to create rides. Um, for those people who are proficient at that, I apologize for uh, doing this part of it. If you're not proficient at this, I'm going to help you. I'm going to try and help you figure out how to do this on your own. Uh, so I'm going to focus on Map My Ride. Susan mentioned that Strava is another one that's get used. I think Strava is used by more people now. I use Map My Ride just because I started using it and I'm familiar with it. So. Um, I keep using it. So you, you go to Map My Ride, and then there's this option to create your own route. Um, so you choose the create route. And um, so if you go there, it's just like, you know, it uses Google Maps. So you, you, could, you could start planning a ride that started at the Cary Memorial Library, which is right there in the center. And uh, if you don't know about this little yellow person over here in the margins on Google Maps or on Map My Ride, you should learn to use this person because when you drag this person onto the map, you can get street views from any location that's been mapped. So this is, uh, if you pull the little yellow person down onto the street, you can see the Cary Library. Uh, and this becomes real, you'll see how this is useful in terms of planning your routes. So what I wanted to do, I've done this in pieces. I've never done this exactly the way that I'm gonna describe it to you now, but uh, I'm gonna describe how I would go about planning this. So what I often wanna do is plan a back roads bike ride in an urban area. So like the, uh, Lexington ride that I just described. And so uh, it's an interesting challenge to figure out how to do that in Boston. And uh, what I'm going to describe is using both the Emerald Necklace, the set of parks that were, that were uh, 
designed and uh, then created by Olmsted. Uh, and so the emerald necklace goes across the top part of the map and then bends around into the Arboretum and Franklin Park. We're going to only go as far as the um, as kind of near the Arboretum. And then we're going to come back on what's called the Southwest Corridor Park, which is that little narrow green band right in the center of the map. And if you're not familiar with this, it is a, it's really a great little secret. So we're gonna start this ride at the Boston Public Gardens. Where you're gonna park, I have no idea. That's your problem to solve. Um, and you know, you could start this ride at any other place along this loop. Um, but starting the ride at the Boston Public Garden, and let's say you've parked somewhere else and you're on your bike and you wanna figure out, okay, how do I get, how am I gonna leave the Boston Public Garden to find my way down this strip down the center of Commonwealth Ave. So you're gonna drag, you've dragged the little yellow person down and you've put her or him or them right here. And you're looking to see what it's gonna look like when you depart from the garden. So when you pull the little yellow person onto the map, it highlights all the roads that have been photographed by Google Maps. Um, in uh, Boston, it's pretty much everywhere. In rural areas, it's not everywhere. So some, some things will get highlighted in blue and some won't. So if you drag the little yellow person down and you're standing inside the public garden looking towards Commonwealth Ave, this is what it's going to look like. So you can see what this gate's going to look like. So you say, okay, that's where I'm going to depart the public garden and then you're going to cross Arlington Street and then there's the beginning of the bike trail that you're going to be on. So this is the lane, this is the bike trail that's in between both sides of Commonwealth Ave. You get down to the end of uh, the Commonwealth Ave thing and this is one of the few places, there's a couple of places on this where the whole emerald necklace is discontinuous. Uh, it's still there, but it's hard to bike. So you have to figure out how you're going to get from the end of Commonwealth Ave over to uh, the beginning of the, the Fens part of the Emerald Necklace. So you take a left on Hereford Street, you go down Boylston Street, and then it's going to be a little trafficy in there. And then you're looking for this uh, statue at the corner of Boylston and Fenway. Uh, and so if you've, if you've done, if you're planning to do this ride and you've done this and you've got these visual images in your head, it makes it much easier to figure out what you're doing. So this is the beginning of the bike trail for a bunch of different bike trails on both sides of the uh, water course through the Emerald Necklace. So you're going to start you're starting from up in this upper right-hand corner where that gateway is, and then you're following the Emerald Necklace all around uh, along the riverway. Um, and it's just, uh, if you haven't ever done it, it's a great bike ride. Olmsted knew what he was doing. And you're gonna take it as far as the end of Jamaica Pond, and I'll tell you what happens there. So. You know, this is this is what the trail looks like. A remarkable accomplishment to feel like you're in the country, even though you're in downtown Boston. And if you're interested, if you're a Frederick Law Olmsted fan, uh, you probably uh, Many people, most people probably haven't heard about the fact that there's this Frederick Law Olmsted National Historic Park, which, is, which preserves his home and architectural studios. Uh, and it's about a quarter mile, less than a quarter of a mile off of the bike trail through the Emerald Necklace. So you've gotten to the end of uh, Jamaica Pond 
and you've got to make it down to, I hope you can see my cursor, right down here where it says Southwest Corridor Park. That's where the, the Southwest Corridor begins. Uh, and uh, again, you've got this little discontinuity here where you aren't bike trails. And so you've got to figure out how to get there. So one way is to go on the Arbor Way, which if you put the little yellow person down on the Arbor Way, you'll see it's really trafficy. There is a bike lane in some of it, but it's not the kind of place, it's the kind of place I want to avoid. Uh, it, it's apparent that what you'd want to do is go from Jamaica Pond down and then go into the Arboretum and then bike along the trails in the Arboretum. But if you put the yellow person down inside the Arboretum and look at the trails, you'll see that over here, this little fuzzy marker is a bike with a slash through it. So you find that, oh, no biking in the Arboretum, too bad. So that's why this, you know, getting to a street view and looking at these trails gives you a sense of what you can do and what you can't do. However, uh, if you if you go back and on the map, you'll see that uh, there's this little road that runs from Jamaica Pond and then runs right along the side of the Arbor Way down to where you want to go, and it's called Orchard Street. And so you put the little person down on Orchard Street and you see that it's a quiet, untrafficked, shady place to bike. And so that's the way you get from Jamaica Pond down to the Southwest Corridor Park. And there's even a bike, a biker on it when they took the pictures that day. So you get down here to the beginning of the Southwest Corridor Park, which is gonna look like this. There's this nice little circle this is the entrance to the Southwest Corridor. And you're gonna go from down here at the lower left-hand corner of the image, which is, the, which is where that little circle is, uh, all the way down to the back, way, the back bay subway uh, T station. It's almost five miles. It's a remarkable accomplishment of urban design. Uh, and it's really interesting to read the history of, of uh, kind of neighborhood and citizen engagement in the creation of the corridor park. So it's a charming little oasis of greenness with very little traffic along the way. Sometimes it's within a, a park a parkland on both sides, sometimes it's right along the road, but it's a designated trail. Uh, there's a few little discontinuities along the way where you have to kind of weave a block or two to find the next section, but that makes it fun. It, it, it is often, uh, there is a lot of bike and pedestrian traffic. Uh, so be sure, even though you're on a designated uh, bike trail, be sure to wear your helmet because more likely that you're gonna crash with another bike than with a car. And so this whole loop is 12 miles with about 267 feet of elevation gain, which is pretty flat. Uh, so there's a function on Map My Ride that allows you to get this elevation profile. Uh, doesn't matter very much when you're biking around Boston. It does matter when you're creating rides in rural areas with in hilly terrain. And so you can plot out a, a course and then see what the elevation is and you can there's a feature to help you figure out what the percentage of grade is on certain hills and after you've done this a while you understand that you know a two or three percent grade is mellow a five percent grade starts to involve a little work an eight percent grade often has you standing up in the pedals and ten percent grade is pretty steep so the elevation function is really good when you're planning these loops. So in summary, uh, the book includes bike rides from all six states. Uh, the, the northernmost ones are in the, uh, there's one of my favorite rides is a ride in, the, in Vermont's Northeast Kingdom around uh, Greensboro, Vermont. This is Caspian Lake in the background there. 
so there's a bunch of a couple of northern Vermont rides. There's a, a great ride on Cape Cod that doesn't really involve the Cape Cod Rail Trail. Instead, it does it goes on all these little back sand roads and fire trails through the national park. Uh, another fantastic ride. So uh, these are great rides that you wouldn't necessarily figure out yourself. And so uh, I've given you this opportunity to find out how to get to them. So that's it. I'll leave that last image on the screen. So Susan, I'm done. All right, thank you. Um, we do have a couple questions from the Q and A. Um, a couple people want to know if you've used Ride with GPS. Is it, if that's an app, no. Okay, if, if that person can say more about what they're asking, I haven't used. Sure. Is it um, a Ra a, a, Jeep, a, a website or an app? Um, someone else is asking, um, do you attach your phone to your bike while you ride? And then I, I think a couple people too had said that um, ride with GPS like talks into your ear and gives you the right. directions. Does the one that you use do that too? Uh, uh, no, it does. It. Uh, my wife tends to ride with uh, her phone mounted on her handlebars. And so if we've mapped a ride, she's, follow, she's following it on her phone. It doesn't, uh, we don't use the function where it talks to you. Um, I don't think I would like that. Uh, the, one of the downsides of this book was that uh, all these rides exist on Map My Ride. And you can, I think that they're all publicly posted. Um, but I wanted to include a link in the book to the uh, the Google Map version of the ride, and the publisher said no, which I thought was a big mistake. So you could write to the publisher and tell them, ask them why they don't have the links to the maps. But I'm pretty sure all the maps are there. So if you searched for uh, Sobel and the name of the ride or the place of the ride, they would probably come up and then you'd be able to get them at least you could get the map on your phone. Right, thank you. Um, and then someone asked, does your book indicate the kind of bike recommended for the rides? Um, these people only have road bikes. I know you said that yes. you have hy hybrid bikes. Yeah, most of these are um, two thirds to three quarters of these are fine for road bikes. If they're, I haven't quite ever calculated what percentage of time you're on pavement versus percentage of time you're on gravel roads. It's probably about 50, 50. So um, most of the rides are fine for road bikes. There are a few that are not. And I indicate that at the beginning of the ride. The Rattlesnake Gutter Ride is not a mountain bike ride. Uh, the Cape Cod uh, sand, the Back Roads Ride is not a mountain bike ride. Um, that's a better mountain. It's not a road bike ride. It's a better mountain bike ride. But again, two thirds to three quarters of them are five for road bikes. Great. Um, and then someone asked, how do you deal with flat tires and remote areas? Yeah, good question. You know, I hate to confess this, but I have never gotten good at changing, at changing my own tires. I carry a little, um, you know, carbon dioxide uh, pressurized air uh, container um, and a patch kit. Uh, sometimes the pressurized air will get you enough air in your tire to get to some place where you can get somebody to fix your tire. But, um, you know, sometimes, you know, when I, when one of us has a flat tire and we don't have a patch kit or something along the other person just rides back to the car and comes to pick us up. So I don't have a good, I don't have a good solution for it. Um, and then along that same, a thought process. 
Um, someone asked, what is the basic set of tools, equipment, or supplies that you carry for your rides? Yeah, so these are all, you know, as I said in the beginning, these are all 10 to 20 mile rides. So for the most part, you don't need anything other than a water bottle and your helmet, right? Um, we, I don't carry a, a, a bike pump. I always have a bike pump in my car uh, and I often uh, pump up tires before we go on bike rides. But if you're doing a 10 or 20 mile ride, um, you know, there's not a lot of repairs that you're gonna need to do in the course of an hour or two. So credit card. I always have a, I have a, always have a, a cash or credit card in my pocket. I love my friend Craig uh, one summer road from his house in Keene, New Hampshire down to Wellfleet uh, uh, with a t-shirt and his bike shorts on and a credit card in his pocket. And that was all, <laughs> that was, and a water bottle. And a helmet. That was that was his total set of equipment. So for these kinds of you know for these kind of rides, you don't really need that much. Um, and then David and I were actually talking about this a little bit before the program, but someone's oh. asked if you're familiar with the East Bay bike path starting in Providence then going south. And then do you know if there's a way to bike um, from Providence all the way to Newport? It's, uh, no, I am familiar with the East Bay bike trail. I have been on sections of it. I haven't done all of it. I've never tried to bike from Providence to Newport. There is a good, there are two good Rhode Island bike rides in the book. Rhode Island's a little underrepresented. One of them is a little Compton bike ride. So that whole farm coast area. Little Compton, South Dartmouth, New Massachusetts, fantastic biking area. And then there's a great bike trail. There's a great bike ride that uses the Blackstone River uh, bike trail as one part of a loop that's mostly in Lincoln, Rhode Island. But, and I have done, and I've done biking on that nice trail that on the other side of Providence, but I've never gone from uh, Newport to Providence. Um, and then what are your thoughts on integrating public transportation, commuter rail, subway, et cetera, into rides, um, in lieu of driving? Yes, I'm, um, I'm, will likely do it this summer. We've not, I've been thinking about it for the last few years. I want to take Amtrak north from Brattleboro or Bellows Falls somewhere to somewhere north in Vermont. Uh, one way and to drive back, uh, to ride back. Um, I did find out from talking to the Amtrak conductor about a week, couple of weeks ago that they own, on that train, they only have storage capacity for one bike per car. And that, car, and that uh, train is only four or five cars. So you can only do uh, up to four bikes on that. Uh, and you have to reserve it in advance. So I am planning on doing that. I don't use, I've never tried to do public transportation in the Boston area, just because I don't bike ride that much in that area. Um, certainly on the Cape, there is that, uh, there is that national park uh, bus service that allows you to use the, um, to load bikes on the bus around the Cape. So if you want to do one-way rides on Cape Cod, that's easily doable. Hmm. Um, someone's asked, have you biked on Route 100 in Vermont? Uh, some. I do have a friend who's done the, the, the Route 100 ride from north to south. You know, it's like 200 miles. I think he did it in two days. I was completely impressed by it. Um, Route 100, yeah, I've been on pieces of it. It's beautiful. A lot of times it doesn't have a great shoulder. Um, and it's, you know, it gets a lot of fast traffic. So Route 100 is a good example of a, of a road that I use if I need to, to make an interesting loop. But in Vermont, what I want to do is be on, um, is on less trafficked, more back roads. 
So there is a nice, I've done nice rides around uh, Weston and Londonderry, Vermont, where I used Route 100 as part of the ride. All right. And um, going back to your book, you mentioned that a lot of these rides that you have um, take you through what you've called these lost villages. Mm -hmm. um, have these always interested you, these kind of nostalgic towns, or did you start loving them as you worked through your research for the book? No, it was always the, I, I arrived in Nelson, New Hampshire, that the, one of those villages that you go through early in, in that, one of that first drive that I described. I arrived in Nelson, New Hampshire when I was about 22 years old, about 50 years ago, to go to a contra dance. Um, and, you know, the whole contra dancing tradition in New England was kept alive in Nelson and a couple of other towns in the Monadnock region. So I arrived in Nelson, New Hampshire, one dark, really cold February night, having driven a couple of hours from Bennington, Vermont. Um, and, um, you know, after driving through miles of ink dark roads with no houses along it, you arrived at in Nelson and there was this uh, remarkably gay and uh, upbeat uh, contra dance going on and big snow banks all around. And, um, and I think I fell in love with Lost Villages that night. Um, and after, after having been in Nelson, I said, okay, I'm going to live there. And, and then a couple of years later, I moved there for a few years. So, um, so it was really that, and then it's been in, and then in the process of biking over the last 50 years, it became more and more intriguing to me to ferret out these hamlets and crossroads and lost villages that are just, you know, on back roads, off beaten paths, were busy little places at one point in their history and now aren't anymore, but are getting discovered. Harrisville is a great example of a lost village that's, uh, become mildly discovered. All right, that was my own uh, uh, question, so thank you. <laughs> um, have you been tempted by longer multiple day rides? Are there any good ones in New England, the Mid-Atlantic or Canada that you know of? Yeah, this that, that Petit Trend in Nord Trail is, that is a great ride. Um, and there's lots of, if you, uh, do a little research on it. There's a lot, there's a couple of services that take you from the end point of that ride and bus you up to the starting point of the ride. It's about 120 miles, I think. Um, and you can do it in, we did it in five days or five or six days. You can do it in two or three days if you're interested in it. It's, you know, it's an old rail line uh, through kind of um, rural Quebec but it has these great uh, villages along the way. So it's, you kind of get immersed in uh, Quebecois culture and the bike riding is beautiful. Um, there's lots of, you know, there's lots of multi-day rides. There's a great ride around Lake Champlain that I've often considered. Um, there's um, a fantastic, you know, there's the loop around, uh, the northern tip of Nova Scotia. I'm forgetting the name of Cape, the Cape, uh, whatever it is. Um, that's a great bike loop that friends of mine have done. So um, we're just we're just starting to do more of these multi-day trips. Awesome. Um, I think that we've answered just about everyone's questions. Um, one more. Um, you mentioned that you had wanted to do your book on um, the Mount Monadnock area trails. Um, do you have, a, it's probably in your book now, but do you have a favorite one from that area? Well, the favorite, the favorite one is the one that's in the book. Um, the Harrisville, Nelson, Chesham, Dublin ride. If, if you're intrigued with Monadnock area rides, I write a column 
for the Keene Sentinel, which is the daily mag, the daily newspaper in Keene, New Hampshire, uh, publishes a once a week magazine called Elf. And once a month, I write a bike column for the magazine. And so I've done that for about three years. And most of the rides that are in the column are not in the book. So they're all Monadnock region bike rides. So you could, I'm not quite sure how you do this. If you search for Keen Sentinel, Sobel, Bicycle, I think you could pull up a bunch of those. Uh, there is one really good ride that starts in the village of Westmoreland and uh, does a loop around Spofford Lake. And um, the place where it starts is a um, great little kind of lost hidden village cafe. And at, near the end of the ride are a couple of very cool little swimming holes. So that one, is that one in the book? That one is in the book. Yeah, so it's the Westmoreland Lake Spofford bike ride. But if somebody's interested in these Monadnock region rides, there are a whole bunch of other ones that are not in the book that have been in this Elf magazine for the Keen Sentinel. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time, David. Um, thank you to everyone who tuned in tonight. We had a very good crowd. Um, so again, this program will be recorded and it will be up on our Cary Library YouTube ch um, channel. So give a little virtual round of applause to David. Um, and David, if there's anything that you wanted to kind of promote before we sign off? Can't think of it. Can't think of anything. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll just sign off together then. Um, everyone in the chat is saying thank you so much. Um, so thank you, everybody, and have a good night.